I was reading a while back about some professional taste testers. And how part of their training was not only tasting lots of things, but also developing a vocabulary. Lots of different words for lots of different tastes. Kind of like that Calvin and Hobbes cartoon, where Calvin is saying, hmm, there's the automare. It's really hard to describe. And Hobbes says, no, it's, it's kind of snorky and brambush. <laughs> If you have a very refined sense of smell, you can make up your own words. But it requires a very precise vocabulary to sort all these things out. It's not all you need, of course. You have to have a very sensitive palate as well. But it really does help to have a very precise vocabulary to make distinctions and to open your mind to possibilities. It's one of the reasons why we study as part of the practice, is to have a set of concepts, a set of ideas, so we can make distinctions when things happen in the mind. That's what the Four Noble Truths are all about. You have to learn to distinguish between stress and suffering on the one hand and its cause on the other. And then there's the path which does involve some stress and suffering. After all, it's made out of aggregates, which are subject to conditions. But you have to use it, and so you have to learn how to recognize which part of the meditation is involving stress that's actually necessarily part of the path, and which part is unnecessary, I mean the added burdens that you place on the mind. We have these concepts so we can sort these things out and also to suggest possibilities, things that could happen in your meditation, followed by instructions. If this happens, this is what you do. If that happens, that's what you do. So that right there gives you the three aspects of discernment that we were talking about earlier today. On the one hand, learning how to make distinctions, and then secondly, learning how to de decide what's connected to what, learning how to detect this, and then finally having some idea of what the possibilities are. If this happens, what could you possibly do? So in the beginning, when you're studying, it's all possibilities. This could happen. But you can't leave it there. In addition to study, there is practice. We actually sit down and do the meditation and watch for things to come up. And they're sure to come up, both pleasant and unpleasant things. Some people get upset when they're doing concentration or practicing restraint of the senses and noticing that their defilements seem to be getting worse for a while. And that's simply because they're penned in. It's like taking a tiger that's used to roaming around, and then you pen it in. It doesn't mean that the pen is bad, or that the tiger is suddenly there because you penned it in, where it wasn't there before. It was there all along, but it was used to roaming around as it liked, and so it could do what it wanted and not complain. But now that you've got it penned in, it's going to roar and bite. But the Buddha gives you ways of dealing with tigers, the techniques of the meditation, things to contemplate, things to develop, things to abandon, if you can remember them in time. This is why mindfulness is such an important part of the path. It's not just being aware, it's also it's primarily remembering. I mean, the alertness is what's aware of what's going on, but they need to remember, okay, when this happens, what are you supposed to do? And then you can apply it. And as you apply it, you begin to gain a sense of what works for your own particular defilements and what adjustments you have to make. It's in learning how to make the adjustments that you really do develop your own discernment. The concepts you hear about or read about, those are all things you borrowed from somebody else. They're not really your own.
It's when you use some of the Buddhist teachings to deal with your own greed, aversion, and delusion, and begin to gain a sense of what works. That's when the, the Dharma becomes your own. That's when you really can say that you are discerning. Otherwise, you just have the, the names of discernment, or the ideas of discernment. But it's when you actually encounter what's going on in your mind, both the good and the not-so-good things, and decide that you're not just going to sit there and allow them to run rampant as they have in the past. You're going to pen them in and do something about them if they're the unskillful side, and you're going to encourage them if they're the skillful side, and point them in the right direction. That's when you develop the, the discernment of, or the practice. When you start getting results, that's the discernment of attainment. So it's only in the actual application of right effort, in other words, noticing what's skillful and what's unskillful, and doing your best to encourage what's skillful and discourage what's not. That's when the discernment really develops. This is why ardency is what John Lee identifies as the discernment element in mindfulness practice. You're not just sitting there watching this arise and that go away, or this arise and that go away. You're realizing, okay, when this arises, it actually causes trouble in the mind. What are you going to do so that it doesn't arise anymore? At the very least, what are you going to do so that it doesn't take over and influence your actions? And you get some ideas from the, from the text. But you also have to develop your own ingenuity. What else might work if your understanding of what's in the text doesn't work? Because after all, your understanding that you gain from reading and listening may not be accurate. That's not the time to go back and say that the texts weren't good. You've got to say, well, whatever it is I need to do right now, what's the possibility? And this is where you have to develop your own ingenuity, which is why one of those one-size-fits-all kind of meditation techniques, or the meditation technique that says don't do any thinking, just note, 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 or scan, scan, scan. And somehow the technique is going to magically take care of everything. That doesn't really give you the opportunity to develop your, that side of your discernment, which involves ingenuity, seeing what the alternatives are. You try X and it doesn't work, well, what's, what Y or Z is out there that you might try? Or do you have to tweak an X to make it work? So it's this element of ingenuity that really makes a difference, that really expands the Dharma, expands your discernment and understanding of the Dharma. An important part of this is getting a sense of time and place, what teaching needs to be applied at what time. Because there are many different teachings, there are many different ways of looking at your experience. What's appropriate for the particular issue that you're dealing with? This is why not all of the Buddha's answers are categorical. Some of them depended on the context, what he called analytical answers. You have to bring in your appreciation of what are the various factors that are applying right now. There was the case where a person asked a monk one time about what are the results of action. And the monk said, well, all action results in stress and suffering. And the person asked him, said, well, I never heard that from anybody, at least not any Buddhist monks. So the monk went and asked the Buddha, and the Buddha said, you fool, that's not how you answer that question. And another monk chimed in and said, well, you know, he was talking about all, all feelings are stressful. And the Buddha says, another fool. When you're asked about actions, you ask about karma, you, you talk about skillful and unskillful actions, and you talk about the three kinds of feelings that come up from the actions. Because if you tell someone that all actions lead, in suffer, and lead to suffering and stress, then why would they bother trying to do anything skillful? In other words, you have to have a sense of when a particular teaching is appropriate and when it's not. 
you learn that part of this by being around people who've practiced. This is why we have the apprenticeship. Why the Buddha set up the apprenticeship. Because a lot of this cannot be explained in words, but you can pick it up by being around people who've trained, if you're sensitive and if you're open to learning. This is why one of the most important verses in the Dhammapada is about the difference between the tongue that can taste the soup and the spoon that can be in the soup for days and days and days and not know the taste at all. You've really got to be sensitive. You've got to be open to good examples. So the discernment is not just the ideas. They suggest possibilities. And they prepare you to look for certain distinctions. But to actually see those distinctions requires a lot of sensitivity on your part. Again, it's like the professional taste testers. They can learn the vocabulary for all the different types of taste there may be. But if their tongues can't pick out the difference between one taste and the next, then the vocabulary is pretty useless. At least they're not getting any use out of it. So it's in the effort to put these things into practice and figure out, okay, what in your mind is a defilement? What in your mind is something skillful? So you can then figure out, well, how do you encourage the skillful side and how do you abandon the unskillful side? It's only when you really try that you begin to get a real sense for these things. And you really do get the results that they're aimed at, which is freedom. Freedom from the stress and suffering that you've been causing for yourself and you've been putting up with for who knows how long. So even as you do something as simple as observe the precepts, practice restraint of the senses, or sit here trying to get the mind just to settle down be quiet for a bit, there's a lot of discernment that comes with the act of trying discerning that, okay, this is something worthwhile to try. There are a lot of people out there that don't see the worth of this at all. At all. At the very least, you see it's worthwhile, and it's worth spending time with and putting up with the difficulties. Because when you have a teaching about stress and suffering on the one hand and the possibility of an ultimate unconditioned happiness on the other. The, the appropriate discerning response is, okay, there's something you've got to do here. You don't just read about it, think about it. It's a challenge. Can I do this? What can I do to do this? How can I figure this out? As John Fuhring said, don't expect everything to be handed to you on a platter. If there's something in the teachings that doesn't make sense, it's not because there's something wrong with the teaching. There's something lacking in your willingness to try to make sense out of it. So again, it's a challenge. And the discerning response is to take the challenge, be up for the challenge, because otherwise where are you going to be? Just suffering the same way you've been suffering all along. And you're free to choose whether or not you want to practice in this way. But there's only one discerning choice. 